I've been meaning to make a new video for several days now, but I've been putting it off and putting it off because I didn't know how to tell this story. Um, I received this story uh, a few, um, about a week ago, um, and it was heartbreaking. Uh, and I, I really want to do the story justice. Um, and I decided that I can't tell the story in my own words. I have to read it in her words. The um, victim would like to remain anonymous because her parents still work at Bob Jones. And obviously I am respecting her wishes. Um, but all the names mentioned, I do know. All the the names I took out um, to respect her. Uh, so now I'm just going to read her story. It's rather lengthy, but um, it's, it's a very heartbreaking story. <clears throat> I'm finally ready to tell my story after 12 years. I'm not ready to give out names. Why? Probably as a defense mechanism. I'm still afraid of being sued or hauled into court. And I'm still afraid of how the truth will be received after being rejected all those years ago. You see, I tried to tell the truth 12 years ago. But instead of being listened to, I was made the bad guy. I was bullied into never talking again. I actually signed papers saying I would never tell the truth again. It sounds unbelievable. But this is Bob Jones University we're talking about. Please know that my parents and some close friends did actually believe me, and they were punished too, to some extent, just as I was. And they are still being punished, in a very passive and subtle way. Yes, my parents are still at BJU. In a perfect world, they could stand up for what's right, take their retirement, and leave. But not under the BJU promise. They are genuinely stuck. So my story begins when I was in high school. I started dating early. Way too early. My parents believed in courtship, and they, cha and they chose someone for me. They deeply regret this now. But at the time, they were under the cult influence of a very influential church in Greenville. By the time I hit college, I realized I didn't want to marry this guy. I just didn't like him that much. I wanted to break up with him, but I wasn't allowed. I tried to anyway, but that didn't go over well. And that's when I began to confide in a friend of mine. This friend was a preacher boy, and we're going to refer to him as preacher boy from now on. Um, he was a graduate student, six years older than me. He was a very popular preacher boy. He was a spiritual leader, a role model, and a dormitory counselor. If you couldn't trust him, but then that thought never crossed my mind. I was barely 18, sheltered by the Bob Jones University world. Heck, I'd only kissed the guy I'd been dating for three years, nothing more. I was as naive as they come. So I went for a drive with my preacher boy friend in his car to talk about my problems. God says to obey your parents, but I didn't want to marry my boyfriend. Do I have to anyways? Was this fair? The preacher, the preacher boy drove to a remote park and put the car in park. I started to talk, but I only got about three words out before I started crying. Without warning, my preacher friend grabbed my breast. I honestly, naively, had no idea what to do. Without saying anything, he stopped and drove me home. Over the next few months, I tried to process what this meant. A respected man of God was doing things to me that made me feel uncomfortable. And yet, I liked him. I respected him. And I assumed that he liked me. So I continued to see him, because I didn't know what else to do. He had a strange power over me, even though I protested many times over the things he would do, both during and after. He would write eloquent letters stating how, quote, sorry 
he was, and that these things would never happen again. And yet, they continued to happen. In real life, if he would ever see me on campus or anywhere in public, he would ignore me. Come to find out, he was doing this to at least two other girls at the same time. When I found out, um, I was furious and heartbroken. I felt like a piece of meat. Of course, I realized that this is a tale which almost everyone has. This is not what makes my story so bad. It's what's to follow. Eventually, he got engaged to his current wife, just weeks after standing outside my bathroom window while I was showering, without my knowledge, until he knocked on the window I was, I was putting my towel on so, he, so I would know he was there. Um, I determined to never look at him or speak to him again, and I put all of the blame on myself. But the campus is small, and I would see him with his new fiance. Now he would try to speak to me. He would literally get in my face and say, Hello, name removed. I never looked at him. I hated him. He was also a singer at a very influential church in Greenville. The music director at the church, my father, found out what happened to me, and he took the preacher boy off the solo list. This guy was all about the attention. It killed him to not be a soloist. And that's when the threats started coming in. It started with a few anonymous phone calls, some to BJU, fabricating stories about me breaking rules, all in an attempt to get me expelled. Then scarier things, including a phone call to my dad where the caller said, quote, Do you know where your oldest daughter is? Because I can see her right now. You better watch out. End quote. Then anonymous letters started coming, things about, quote, forgiveness, end quote, leading up to, quote, Haman made his own gallows, end quote. One of the final letters had a photo of my head cut out and hanging on the gallows. Towards the end, Preacher Boy's father started making phone calls, obviously not anonymous now, to my father, threatening lawsuits and saying he would get up at church and tell everyone that I was a liar and a whore. All this because Preacher Boy wanted to sing solos in church and be a big Greenville pastor someday with a blemish-free record. In the end, Preacher Boy got caught in a lie to the pastor. Preacher Boy actually went to talk to the pastor about why he was no longer allowed to sing solos in church anymore. The pastor asked the Preacher Boy if he had discussed, discussed the situation with a church music director. He said he had, but that the director had failed to give him a reason. The pastor decided to call my father, the church director, the music director, about the situation. After talking with my dad, the pastor asked all of the families to meet at the church to discuss the situation further. We all had to meet at midnight, yes, midnight, on Valentine's Day evening to discuss things with all parties involved. Why midnight? Because Preacher Boy and his family did not want anyone to see them. The, quote, perfect testimony, end quote, must be protected at all costs. So we gathered, me, my parents, him, his parents, his fiance, her parents, whose dad was and is an elder at the church. The room was set up like a courtroom with a judge's table and two opposing sides set up across from each other. The evening began with Preacher Boy's father presenting a briefcase filled with, filled with quote, sad, sad things, end quote. Preacher Boy's father had hired a private investigator to follow me around for four weeks to catch me doing these sad, sad things. He said he didn't want to open it, but he would if my father used the word molest again. Preacher Boy would not admit to any wrongdoing, but I would not back down. We were told, for the good of Christ, that we needed to sign a paper saying we would never talk about these matters again. There was no apology. What I didn't know at this time was that there were several, quote, character witnesses, end quote, called in that night to testify for or against each of us. A current BJU professor was called in to testify against me because he, quote, never saw me having personal devotions, end quote, in the time he knew me. 
Another man was called in to testify that I had said something to him that was, that revealed my heart condition. I never knew if there were any character witnesses on my behalf. They were never brought in. Eventually, my family and I were dismissed. Church leaders stayed to talk with Preacher Boy. Supposedly, they had other matters to address with him. I don't know what happened after we left around 3 a.m., but I do know that it got very heated and a police restraining order was issued against Preacher Boy's father because of the threats he made. To this day, Preacher Boy's father is not allowed on church property. Of course, my story doesn't end here. Obviously, Bob Jones had to get involved after this situation happened. Preacher Boy was still a dorm counselor, after all. Since he was one of their own, naturally they called him in first and got his side of the story. But they didn't stop there. They called in my former boyfriend, the courtship guy, and they got him to talk about me. They got him to admit that he had made out with me, so by the time I was called in, my fate was sealed. Preacher Boy said I was a whore, so it was all over. They asked me to write out what happened in my own words, and then read it to them. After I finished reading, I'll never forget what they said. The Dean of Men at the time said, quote, you have very nice grammar, end quote. And the dean of students at the time said, quote, What were you wearing when these instances occurred? End quote. The dean of students went on to, to accuse me of being immodest. Hence, what else was Preacher Boy to do? In the end, Preacher Boy got demoted to library staff for his GA ship but his dorm was told that his demotion was due to his upcoming wedding. I guess he had a lot of shoe shopping to do. My file was marked with a big black spot of death, and I couldn't do anything right after that. The dean of students wrote a letter to my parents, calling me a liar. Somehow, I managed to graduate. Preacher Boy went on to be a popular preacher in Greenville. He was, and is, very hip and cool. I, on the other hand, had a hard, hard time recovering. I felt like a failure, an embarrassment to my parents. I felt like I had been, I felt like I had a big scarlet A on my chest, both at school and at church. I felt like it was my fault and that I didn't deserve to be around anymore. I'm sure this story is difficult for some to understand. It's not like I was beaten within an inch of my life or raped as a toddler. But living for most of your life feeling like a failure when you already struggle with depression is a nasty combination. Living like this while liars are constantly promoted at your own expense is a hard path to walk. And it takes its toll. I just saw last week that Preacher Boy had a link on his church's webpage to an article on how to prevent sexual abuse against children. Ironic. My story has a happy ending because I got out of fundamentalism, but I almost didn't. And there are so many young people that may not make it. This story is atrocious. I cut out a significant amount of information to protect the uh, victim's privacy and to hopefully um, make the video a little shorter. Um, the victim did go on to become very successful um, and she's living a, a good life now um, by the grace of God but what happened to her was horrible and these people they're letting it happen still these people are still in power in Greenville at Bob Jones nothing's changed it happened in in 2000. It's not that long ago. These people are still there. This is still going on. And I have other stories that I will be telling in the future.